When we talk about how Congress or a state legislature exerts control over executive branch agencies, we usually focus first on the statutes, right? So the lawmaking power of the legislature is the most direct way that they can control agencies. They create agencies, they can amend or repeal their uh, enabling statutes, they can expand their powers or restrict their powers through enactments. There's also a powerful tool of holding congressional hearings, whether uh, before a, a committee or a subcommittee, and basically hauling in agency directors and grilling them about something that they don't like. We have the Congressional Review Act that allows Congress by a joint resolution, if it goes to the president, to basically nullify or negate any specific agency action that they don't like. But the last thing we should talk about in our unit about legislative controls of the administrative state or agencies is the control of the purse strings. So the Congress gives, or I'm sorry, the Constitution gives Congress control over uh, the budget and apportionments or allocations every year. And so they um, raise revenue through taxes and then they decide how it's spent. So ultimately, we have the power of the purse. And we have a case that went to the US Supreme Court in 2024 that we're going to talk about in this video about uh, this issue. This is I, something I use, used to not talk about very often um, in my course, but in recent years, there's been more and more litigation about um, appropriations and how agencies are funded. So having said that, let's dive in. So our case is the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau uh, versus the Community Financial Services Association. And I'll explain a little bit about the, the Bureau. We have some other cases in our course uh, about this and, um, and what, who the plaintiffs are. But this is, again, a U.S. Supreme Court case from 2024 about agency funding and the appropriations clause. So just as a little bit of background, most federal agencies get their funding through the annual appropriations process by Congress, in other words, the federal budget. In contrast, Congress enacted a statute that provides funding for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or CFPB, outside the regular annual budget process. The statute authorizes the CFPB to, quote, requisition from the Federal Reserve System, that's a the basically a, a descriptive name for a independent agency or commission that uh, um, regulates national banks and ensures that they have sufficient capital or funds on hand and reserves some funds on hand for um, the United States treasure, Treasury. And so they can ask for or get funding from the Federal Reserve System in an amount that its director deems reasonably necessary to carry out its duties, subject to an inflation-adjusted cap. So it's not any amount in the world they want. Um, it's, it has to um, be, there. there is a statutory cap. And I have the citation for where the statute is. As in all administrative law cases, um, at some point we really need to look at the statute and what it actually says. The intent of this when Congress created the Bureau was to shield it from politics. So if it became, if they had to uh, um, bring an enforcement action against some powerful groups uh, that could lobby Congress, that they didn't want the a retali in retaliation that the agency would be defunded in the next uh, budget cycle. Now, I do want to highlight for my students, um, later in the course, we're going to talk about um, statutes that use this phrase, this word deems necessary. And at times in the past, uh, decades ago, the U.S. Supreme Court held that um, deeming clauses like this that basically give the um, director some discretion to make a decision about what they deem necessary um, come under the Administrative Procedure Act uh, for something that has been entrusted to agency discretion by law and therefore is not subject to judicial review. That doesn't really um, matter in this case, but I just want to flag that for you that near the end of the course, we're going to talk about the word deems um, when it's in administrative agency statutes and that it can take on a lot of legal significance. But having uh, explained the basic funding scheme, let's move on. 
Now let's meet the plaintiffs. The Consumer Financial Services Association of America or CFSA is a trade association for payday uh, lenders or payday loan companies and uh, credit access businesses. And so the, these are um, either uh, people that will help you do debt consolidation um, or if you've ever um, seen payday loan uh, outposts, a lot of times they're in, they have a storefront in the shopping plaza. Um, sometimes you'll see signs for this on um, pawn shops or tattoo parlors and things like that, that they also will do payday loans. And basically what you do is if you run out of cash in the middle of the month, you can go in with your pay stubs and they will advance a portion of the cash um, for your next paycheck. And then when you get paid, you basically have to pay back the loan. And these are almost always high interest loans that can become really burdensome for um, the consumer. And um, basically the CFPB, um, it's their job to protect consumers from exploitation by unscrupulous lenders. And so um, they, they adopted or promulgated a new regulation that would have put some restraints on um, uh, payday loan companies for and debt consolidation groups for questionable practices and thereby limited their ability to make profit. Now, the uh, CFSA challenged the regulations about high interest consumer loans on statutory grounds uh, and then in the alternative as a violation of the appropriations clause in the constitution. So since it wasn't clear if they could win on the statute, they, in the alternative, argued that the agency itself should not exist because its funding arrangement, uh, statu its statutory funding arrangement is unconstitutional. And in case you didn't study the appropriations clause in your constitutional law course, I have it here on my slide. It's Article 1, uh, Section 9, Clause 7 that says no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. The court in a seven to two decision, so this did not split on party lines, upheld the CFPB funding arrangement, even though it shields the Bureau from the politics of the annual budget battles in Congress. And the majority held that an appropriation under the appropriations clause is simply a law that authorizes expenditures from a specified source of public money for designated purposes. I uh, pulled out a quote that I thought was important for those of you who like to highlight in your cases. Um, based on the Constitution's text, the history against which that text was enacted and congressional practice immediately following ratification. So here we're talking about in the late 1700s, uh, around the time of the ratification of the Constitution. Uh, we conclude that appropriations need only identify a source of public funds and authorize the expenditures of those funds uh, for designated purposes in order to satisfy the appropriations clause. Note the invocation of history, um, text, and basically the tradition um, in the early republic. So the majority opinion by Justice Thomas is mostly a long and very detailed historical account of the varied approaches to government budgets in the early republic and how apportionments worked even in 17th century Britain and the colonies and the early republic before the War of Independence. So if you really like um, legal history and digging down into the uh, details of it, you will love this opinion um, because it goes through a lot of um, old sources and gives a kind of a thorough historical account. If you uh, find all of that really tedious, you may want to skim uh, this opinion because it's um, heavy on the history from the 1600s and 1700s and maybe early 1800s. So uh, one of the CFSA's main arguments was that removing agency funding from Congress's annual budget process violated the separation of powers and could lead to a lot of agencies having no political accountability. Now, the, uh, on the one hand, the court in here uh, basically rebuts that saying, that the annual appropriations process is not the only way that Congress gets to um, exert control. And so it's not true that the agencies can just run wild if they 
um, aren't funded but through the annual budget process, Congress can still amend their statutes, call people in and for grilling at their public hearings and committee hearings. They can invoke the Congressional Review Act to nullify specific agency actions on and on. So it's budgets are usually something that I talk about at the end of our unit about legislative controls of administrative agencies um, because the others are kind of more important for litigation and um, and lawmaking and for law students to learn about. The, the other thing I want my students to recognize is that the places are basically making sort of an extreme slippery slope argument here, that if you let the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau do this, then before you know it, Congress is going to have all, hundreds of agencies that have no political accountability at all. Well, that hasn't happened, and that would have to be done by Congress. And we have Congress that the houses change parties regularly or are divided and um, basically uh, get kind of gridlocked and can't get a lot done. So it's a, a little doubtful that this extreme scenario could even happen because it would require unified action from both houses of Congress and a sympathetic president that would sign off on the laws to change the funding source for all of these agencies, it's unlikely to happen. Now, um, you should be aware, since you're studying administrative law, that there are some important agencies or branches of the federal government that do get their funding outside of the annual budget apportionments. And keep this in mind when you hear people say, talk about things like the taxpayer shouldn't be paying for this because there are actually things that the federal government does that the taxpayer isn't paying for. So some agencies um, like the Office of the Comptroller of Currency or um, some of the subdivisions in the federal ju judiciary are mostly or at least partly self-funded through um, fees that they collect like court filing fees or application fees and things like that, or fines that they get when they bring enforcement actions and so forth. So um, we do have some activity in the government that's essentially self-funded through various fees and fines and, um, and does not necessarily take money from the tax revenue uh, directly. Now, the other thing I want you to be aware of is that constitutional challenges based on funding sources are also usually an indirect means to fight an enforcement action or an unfavorable um, regulation. So this may sound or be context and pitched to the court as sort of this grand like uh, um, political question or question about our constitutional concern about our constitution and democracy and so forth, but the case is typically brought by someone who just doesn't like what the agency is doing. Either they're the target of an investigation or enforcement action, and so they're trying to get the agency not to exist anymore, or they don't like a regulation that the agency just promulgated. And so the only way that they can challenge it instead of on the merits is to um, challenge the existence or legitimacy of the agency itself. And that's kind of what's going on in these cases. Now, we do have a dissent in this case from Justice Alito, joined by Justice Gorsuch, who um, basically uh, liked one of the other versions of originalism and use of history. And he, so, in other words, the majority opinion written by Justice Thomas and the others said, looked at a lot of examples from our early history and found that there was a wide variation in how different um, government activities and agencies were funded. And, um, but there wasn't, weren't any that were the exact arrangement that we have here with the CFPB of getting money from the Federal Reserve. And so Justice Alito says it should have to be exactly the same, not merely analogous. And it, the quote from his dissent that I pulled out is the government was unable to cite any other agency with a funding scheme like this. And what he means is exactly like this. And so I do want you to be aware that there are competing versions, even among the justices on the Supreme Court who would call themselves originalists. There are different versions of originalism so that sometimes could produce a different result in the same case. So in recent years, the court's majority has increasingly switched to a history-based originalist jurisprudence. And you should be aware that this presents some trade-offs, that the judges 
went to law school, right? They're trained as lawyers before they become judges, not necessarily as historians. And so you could, uh, some historians would argue that this is armchair historicism. These are amateurs who are pretending that they have the qualifications to just decide the one right answer for how things were done um, 200 years ago. And they don't necessarily have any training or expertise in that. Their training is in legal questions. And then the other thing to keep in mind is that even among conservatives on the court, there are different approaches to this. We have another case from the Supreme Court where Justice Roberts um, basically says uh, the uh, phrases in the Constitution are not supposed to be, or the practices in the early republic are not trapped in amber. In other words, we're, we don't have to go back and pretend that we have to have the exact legal system that they had in 1792 or 1793 um, in a modern society. It's okay to have it be analogous. But as we see from this case, there are some on the court who don't agree, who actually would like to have our legal system be as um, much simpler and much closer to what we had when we only had 13 states um, that sort of lined the Eastern seaboard. So that um, concludes our uh, lecture about uh, the CFPB versus the CFSA and um, budget apportionments and issues with the uh, uh, appropriations clause in the constitution.